13 in the red. Sound the battle across through the foe at night. Sound the battle cry, see the foe is night. Raise the banner high for the Lord. Gird your armor on, stand firm, everyone. Praise the Lord, cause upon his holy word. Rouse them soldiers, rally round the banner. Ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throne. Stand, stand. If not, stay seated. <laughs> Solve this problem. Uh, verse 2. Strong to beat the foe, marching as we go. All our cause we know must prevail. Shield and banner right, leaning in the light. Battling for the right, we never can fail. Rousing soldiers, rally around the banner. Ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Oh, thou God of all, hear us when we call. Help us one and yep. all by yep. thy grace. When the battle's done and the victory won, may we wear the crown before thy face. Thousand soldiers fell around the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throne. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord. God, uh, we live in a very busy world, God. And, uh, Lord, sometimes we just battle every day just to get places on time and, and get things done on time. And, and Lord, uh, uh, thank you that you help us through uh, this time in history, Lord. It's, a, it's a, quite a time to live in. But mostly, God, we're looking for the time when you come back and get us, Lord. So help us to, to stand and fight. Help us to uh, uh, do what we need to, God. And give us the strength and the power. Uh, thank you, Lord, that we can praise your name. Uh, help us as we do that. And help us as we listen to your word this morning. And have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yep. Come on. Come on back. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound a time for being a part, when the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On the bright and cloudless morning, when the bed and cracks are past, and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to the home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is coming, yonder I'll be there. Let us labor for the truth from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all this wondrous love and care. The book of life is over and the work on earth is done. And the roll is coming, yonder I'll be there. When the roll is coming, yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Amen. Preach it, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. All righty. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 3, 2 Kings 
chapter 3. Today we're going to look at a very unusual military battle. I call this the Battle of the Ditches. The Battle of the Ditches. Now, some of you little ones, you probably never dug a ditch. Ditch digging's hard. Uh, you dug a ditch. Okay. You know, when you first start, you say, oh, this is going to be easy. Then you get down a little further and you, you, you hit the roots and you hit the rocks and and then we get then then you may get an easier time. Boy, you get down to the bottom of that ditch, especially if it's a big old long wide ditch, and you're tired. Because you done dug in ditches. And you know the worst part of it, usually there's something goes in the bottom of that ditch and then you gotta put a lot of dirt back in it. <laughs> That's the worst part. But this is this is a, a unusual battle, and God used ditches. Um, look at verse number 16. Verse number 16. And let's read uh, to verse number 20. The Bible says this. Uh, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not see wind, Neither shall ye see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water for your cattle, uh, wait a minute, for, with water, that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites unto your hand. And ye shall smite every fenced city and every choice city and shall fell every good tree and stop all the wells of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, behold, there came water by the way of Edom and the country was filled with water. Heavenly Father, help us. God, here's a very odd picture. Instead of sharpening swords and spears and getting the arrows ready to fly and making sure their bow was okay, these people are out in the middle of the valley digging ditches. And God, you performed a miracle. Help us in our life, God, to know when to look to you and follow your instructions, Lord. And God, let us see your mighty power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, throughout the Bible, God uses unusual things. Now, I want you to stop and think a minute. I know that's unusual for a lot of Americans, especially those that probably watch the YouTube thing. But why would God do something this way? Why would God do a lot of things the way he did? I mean, remember the story of, uh, of uh, the tax collector came to Peter and said, I want some taxes, and uh, he came to Jesus, and uh, he said, do we pay taxes or not? He said, well, uh, to be a good testimony, we're going to pay taxes. So what did he do? Well, he didn't go to the tax preparer man to get his tax return filled out, and he didn't do that. He didn't go to the bank to get some, withdraw some money to pay the tax man. Uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, he could have took a collection, probably, of the disciples and paid the taxes. But that's not what he did. You know what Jesus sent him to do? Jesus sent him fishing. And, of course, the story went in the Bible that he caught a fish. And when he opened the fish mound, he found a, a piece of gold, a gold coin in there, worth a lot of money. And he went and paid the taxes. Now, why did God do something like that? Uh, he could have just... Uh, made a coin appear in his hand and said, Here, Peter, pay the taxes. But God does these things to us and for us and by us times to show people that it's him that's doing it. Because nobody would think to fight a battle to go down into a valley and just dig a bunch of ditches. That's not why people fought the war. I mean, if you're going to dig a big ditch, you'd, you'd dig one around the castle like a moat. 
Or you might dig a trench like they did in World War I and uh, several previous years and you get down there so the, the enemy couldn't fire on you and then you'd come up over the, the, the trench and uh, you, you know, you'd fight. That's what mankind would do with a ditch. Uh, but that, that's not what God did. He said, just dig them ditches and leave them alone. So here we have this, this thing. And I want you to see the desperate situation these folks were in. If you read the rest of this chapter, you will find out that due to a bad treaty between Judah and the king of Israel, he had to go and fight with Israel. And Israel got themselves trapped by three big humongous armies led by the Moabites. And they didn't know what they were going to do. They didn't have enough people to fight them. They, they sure they were going to lose. And probably under normal circumstances, they would have lost. A lot of people don't know this, but George Washington just about lost the revolution. And then one night, he found out that the, the Hessians were camped out on Christmas Eve across the River Delaware. And they were all drunk and asleep in their tents. So he got a bunch of boats together and he crossed the Delaware. You've seen that famous painting. And he surprised them. And, and from that point on, Washington started winning battles. And he won the revolution. Because the British army considered themselves invulnerable, invincible, unconquerable. But Washington surprised them and won the day. So let's study this battle of ditches, shall we? First thing we're going to look at is the ditches. Okay? We're going to look at the ditches. Now, I don't know how big this valley is. Uh, the land of Israel is full of valleys. You got mountains and valleys and mountains and valleys. And some of them are quite big, so there's some small valleys. But even, even uh, uh, let's say the valley was like seven, eight acres. That's still a lot of ditches to dig. Can you imagine digging them on your property? All them cars being gone, you dig ditches? Man, you'd be wore out. You'd, you'd go and get a ditch digger. See, nowadays you can go to uh, Home Depot or whatever and you can rent a, a, uh, you know, one of those little digger things. Well, they didn't have digger things back in those days. They had a shovel and a back and some arms and they got there and they dug the ditches down. God didn't say how deep the ditches were, but they dug ditches. And it's probably bigger than seven acres. It's probably a pretty long valley. Because remember, we're dealing with three armies and the army of Israel. So four armies was around this valley. Now trenches or ditches are a very old form of defensive or siege warfare. When you wanted to uh, uh, defend yourself, you would dig a trench that was a little bit deeper than a man was tall, and you could climb down in that trench, and you would be uh, invulnerable pretty much to uh, uh, the things that went up overhead. Uh, spears and arrows and that kind of thing. It would be very hard for the enemy to, to get the arrows to fall exactly in your trench. And when guns came along, it was pretty safe because guns pretty well shoot this way. And, 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 you know, they don't go like that unless you're real far away. And that's hard to figure out. Now, if you wanted to siege a city, you would dig a ditch around it and you would get your troops there. Uh, that way you'd have some protection against the folks in the fortress or city. Because most of these cities and things back in the old days uh, were pretty well fortified. Uh, Luke uh, chapter 19, we find out something interesting. Um, it says this, it says, For the day shall come upon thee, that thy enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee about, and keep thee in on every side. See, when, when you siege someone, the idea is so that you cannot get out of the city uh, to go get water, or to go get more food, or to feed your cattle, or to go go get the crops off your land. Because you, you didn't have farmland in, in the city. It was a city. Or in the castle. So you'd put this trench around the enemy wood, and uh, they'd sit there with their enemy, and you'd be trapped in the city. And Jesus said there was coming a day that the enemies of God are going to trap us Christians. You say, is that day coming? Oh, it's coming. I don't know when it's going to get here. So it's, uh, Look, they already had it in Russia. They've got it in China right now. Uh, China is a horrible place for Christians. Or anybody who has religion. As a matter of fact, they're persecuting. Every, they're, they're kind of non-discriminatory in China persecuting people of religion. 
And they're doing horrible things to people. They really are. And they're, and they're wanting to put fear into the rest of the uh, religious population so that they'll either quit doing it or uh, go so far back in the, in, in, in the background that they won't bother them anymore. 1 Samuel 17 verse 20. Uh, this is about David. Uh, he was being pursued by Saul. And this, this happened to David. It said, David rose up early in the morning and uh, uh, left the sheep with a keeper. Uh, no, actually, this is back when he fought Goliath, actually. I'm sorry. Uh, and took, and he went as Jesse had commanded him, and came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. So here, here's the Philistine army on one side, and here's the Israeli army on the other side, and they're fortified. Like in World War I, they're down in the trenches. And when they got ready to fight, they'd come up over the trench, and they would shout, and they would go forth. Um... In World War I, you had the leader of the, the soldiers, and he would have a whistle. And he would blow the whistle and say, over! And everybody would climb up the ladders and go over and charge into uh, no man's land. But as long as you stayed in the trench, you were pretty safe. Uh, trenches sometimes were used to show God's power. And more than once, God used ditches. You say, when's the other place? Well, if you go to 1 Kings 18 you will find the prophet Elijah. And he's got the 450 prophets of Baal, and he has listened to them all day call on Baal. Uh, see, the deal was both of them had built an altar and put a sacrifice on the altar, and they call on their God, and the one that answered by fire and, and burned up the sacrifice uh, would be the true God. And they, they spent all day. They danced, and they cried, and they sang, and they weeped. They cut themselves with knives, and they did everything they could think of to try to get Baal to come down there and take the sacrifices. Well, old Elijah sit there and mock him because Baal wasn't answering. You know why? Because Baal ain't a real God. So the Bible says this in 1832, 1 Kings. And with some stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar. So here he builds one of the old-fashioned stone altars like Abraham used to build. And he digs a ditch around the, around the altar. As great as would contain two measures of seed. We're not sure what the measure was, but it was a pretty good ditch. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood. And he said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. So, I don't know about you, but if you've ever tried to burn wet wood, it don't burn real good. And he's putting water on the sack of the meat. And he's putting water on the stones. And pretty soon in verse 35 it says, And the water round about the altar and filled the trench also with water. So he's got so much water on there. He keeps having them pour barrels of water on the thing. He's, I mean, he's got that thing soaked. About the time of the evening sacrifice, the Bible says he got down on his knees and he prayed to God. Verse 38 says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. So by the time God got done, all that was left was a dry trench. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that bolt of lightning. Wouldn't you? That was some, that was some firestorm. Look, when God wants to, He can show His power. Despite what we can do against Him winning the victory. And Elijah did that on purpose. He wanted to know. He wanted them people that was looking. Uh, I mean, there was a bunch of Israelites there beside the prophets. And they were waiting to see who won the battle. Who, who, who won the bet, as it were. Whose sacrifice got devoured by fire from heaven. Them 450 prophets of Baal didn't make it out alive, by the way. Six blind men approached an elephant one day. Each man put out his hand to touch some part of the elephant. And as he did so, 
he tried to guess what he was touching. And each one of them thought that he had the whole animal kind of scoped out. Uh, one of them thought the elephant was a tree. You ever seen an elephant skin? Oh, I, I can see that. And, and another said, no, this is a wall. <laughs> Big fat elephant. And, and another got a hold of the trunk and said, no, this is a snake. Uh, one of them got hold of the tail, thought it was a rope. And, and one of them got hold of the ear and thought it was a fan. And one of them got hold of the tusk and thought it was a spear. They were really flabbergasted when they found out it was an elephant. You see, we're like the blind man. And the elephant's like what God does. Sometimes we can't tell what God's doing. We think God's doing one thing and he's doing another. And let me tell you something about God. He can be working on you and working on 50 other people all at the same time. And just do one thing to work on y'all. That's the way God is. This army was not using ditches in the normal way, by the way. They went to the valley and they dug it full of ditches. Secondly, I want you to notice deliverance. Deliverance. God provided deliverance. Now the word deliver, the word deliver, if you looked it up in a concordance, appears 296 times in the Bible. If you ever want to be delivered by God, you don't have far to look. All the way through the Bible, it talks about how God can deliver you. Now, I want you to know something very important about uh, deliverance. Most of the time, when we act for when we ask for deliverance, we ask out of fear. Now, you say, "Well, I don't like to admit I'm afraid." Well, you know what? You don't have to admit it to anybody but God. God knows when you're afraid or not. And sometimes you ought to be afraid. Look. If you go over to certain countries, the authorities... Now, when we say authorities, I'm talking about the people with the armies and the guns and the tanks and the airplanes and the bombs. They say, no, you can't have a church... You would be stupid if you weren't afraid of those people. Because they got guns and bombs and planes and things. So when they asked God to help them and deliver them, they were afraid. In Genesis 32, we find Jacob. Jacob is afraid of his brother Esau. He's coming back into the land of Israel. And he's been away at his uncle Laban's place and he's coming back and what he's afraid of he's afraid that Esau is still mad at him because when he left Esau was mad enough to kill him and so he's afraid he says God deliver me Genesis 32 11 deliver me I pray thee from the hand of my brother from the hand of Esau for I fear him at least Jacob was honest about it you better be honest with God. If you're afraid, tell God you're afraid. It's okay. Man, I've told God that a lot of times. Least he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. He said, God, he's, he, he might come and he might hurt me. And worse than that, he, he might hurt the mother and the children. So, it's okay to ask out of fear. But you know what? We need to be humble and repentant and have a good attitude with God. That takes some calming down. My wife found this on the internet the other day. I'm not sure where she found it, but it's about calming down. She found a little blurb that said, Never in the history of calming down has anyone ever calm down by being told to calm down. <laughs> you know, I think that's true. 
that's something you got to do yourself. People, you know, you know, you say, calm them down. No, they got to calm themselves down. There, there's no way you're going to calm them down. You know, in the movies, sometimes they'll slap somebody or throw some water in their face or something. Usually that just makes people mad. Look, you have to calm down and you have to go to God. Humbly. In Job 33, the author of Job is criticizing Job. Job and his three friends had just got through their gab fest. And this is what he says in verse 27. He says, uh, He looked upon man... God, he's talking about. And if any say I have sinned and pervert that which is right and profit and profit me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit and his life shall see the light. Uh, he's trying to say, look, Job, all you have to do is go to God and be honest with God and say, God, I'm a sinner. I told that to the people at the funeral yesterday. Um, look folks, we're sinners, even saved, we're saved sinners. I told the people at the funeral, I talked about uh, the bridge that broke, the three mile bridge, remember that? And, and people had to go way around the long way, and then they had to go home way around the other way, and finally they got a ferry running, but I remember, I remember all the people complaining how, how far it was to go way around the long way. And just imagine us, we're, we're in our life like a car, and, and we got some gas in the tank. And you know, as sinners, we haven't got a full tank of gas. Not only that, we're bankrupt, we ain't got no money to buy no gas. Chances are, you try to start around God and go, go a different way. Even as a Christian, you get out of the will of God and try to do something God want, don't want you to do, chances are you're going to be sitting there stranded on the side of the road and you can't get there where you want to get. Jesus is always building bridges for us and delivering us. But you have to go humbly. You have to go with the right attitude. And then... I mean, he'll turn the lights on, he'll, he'll open up the road, and, and, and pretty soon you're on the other side. Because you did it through God, and the way he wanted you to do. Even if it means do something silly like dig, dig a valley full of ditches. Faith is able to help us. See, faith not only saves you, but it keeps you going in your Christian life. And Jehoshaphat had to come to a place. He had messed up. He had signed a treaty he shouldn't have. He shouldn't have been there in that battle. But he was there, and he was asking God to deliver them. And he he finally had to come. And he said, "Well, I guess I'm going to have to have faith in God, no matter what mistakes I've made." Psalm seven verse one talks about this. David said, "O Lord, my God." In thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Now if there ever comes a time when people really do persecute you, you need to remember Psalm 7 verse 1. Because God will save you and deliver you from those that persecute you. The Emperor Trajan... In the Roman days, talked to a rabbi called Rabbi Joshua. And he, and he told the rabbi, he said, You teach that your God is everywhere and boasts that he resides among your nation. He said, Rabbi Joshua, I would like to see your God. Rabbi Joshua said, Well, God's presence is, is indeed everywhere. But he cannot be seen. No mortal eye can behold his glory. Well, said Joshua, after the emperor insisted on seeing him, I suppose we could look at one of his ambassadors. So the emperor said, well, that's a good idea. Usually you can tell something about the, the person that sent the ambassador by looking at the ambassador. And the rabbi took him to the open air uh, and, and, and into the field and, and bade him look at the sun. 
at like at noon on a bright sunny day. And, and then the Emperor Trajan said, I cannot. The light dazzles me. I can't look at the sun. Joshua said, you are unable to endure the light of one of his creatures. The sun is his ambassador. How can you expect to behold the glory of the Creator? Would not his brightness of his glory annihilate you? Of course, this was a rabbi that didn't believe in Jesus. That's why God sent Jesus. Because he knew that you couldn't look at him. That's why when we get to heaven, we've got to have glorified bodies, folks. We put our faith in that powerful God. The same God that made the sun and the solar system and the stars and the nebulas and the galaxies. That God. He's our friend. He lives inside of us. He answers our prayer. He can deliver us. And finally, I'd like to talk about destruction. So I thought God delivered him. Yeah, but he had to destroy the enemy. Don't you get it? God can fix your enemies. God can help the church. God can help the Christian. When we trusted him. But we have to be careful not to put ourselves in a place where we invite God's destruction. You know, these enemies of Israel, they were, they were uh, uh, wanting to get a hold. See, uh, Jerusalem was uh, full of all kinds of things that Solomon had put there. A golden temple with golden vessels and, and, and uh, you know, uh, brass shields and, and palatial places. And they, Solomon had all kinds of riches and exotic animals. And, 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 you know, people would look at that and they'd say, boy, I want some of that. You know what they were doing? They were following their flesh. And you as a Christian have to be careful not to follow our flesh. Now, you got to take care of the flesh. You got to feed it. You got to make sure it gets plenty of rest. You got to make sure it gets plenty of water to drink. You got you to make sure it gets exercise and, and the mental faculties are, are exercised. And, uh, but, but that doesn't mean you, you give in to what the flesh wants. Because the flesh always wants what it doesn't really need. I came home last night and, and it, it, it was kind of hot outside. And I brought some supper. And we were watching the news on television and, and all of a sudden this commercial came for this ice cream. And Linda says, boy, I'd like some ice cream. You know, well, that's fine. You know, but does it look like I really need ice cream? No, not really. Uh, and I, I could have got up and I could have gone out and got some ice cream, but I didn't. Because, you know, the flesh really doesn't need the ice cream. Now, every now and then, yeah, I eat you some ice cream. But we don't do that. We buy a gallon or two and put it in the freezer and every night we're scooping out ice cream and eating ice cream. And you, you let us have, you let the flesh out, you know, I would eat the whole thing. That's the way the flesh wants. It, it overdoes it. And that's a picture of America, I'll tell you, Americans. Philippians 3.19 talks about people that follow the flesh. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. And whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. I wouldn't follow the flesh if I were you. Take care of it, yes. Follow it, no. Because all it does is lead down the path. And, and, and that's why God is so against some things in this world. So why does he let them continue? Oh, he's coming to fix it. Once he gets the church taken out of the way... You need to look out. If all you... Look, look, you folks on YouTube. If suddenly all your Christian friends disappear one day and you can't find them, you better look out. Because it's fixing to get bad. The false prophet and their false teachings one day will have their destruction. I mean... There's a lot of people teaching all kinds of goofy things. You say, well, 
They seem to prosper. They got a bigger church than we have. They get more money than we do. They seem to get more proselytes than we do. I mean, what, what's up with that, Brother Jeff? Well, one day God's going to put a stop to all that mess. He's going to take his big Holy Ghost thumb from heaven. He's going to go... Pow. I wish I'd get saved. And quit teaching that mess is what I wish. I don't glory in the fact they're headed for destruction. But if you don't believe what the Bible says about salvation, and you don't believe in Jesus Christ and the way of the cross and the good old fashion of receiving Christ as your Savior and being born again, I'm afraid you're headed for hell and you're going to burn forever and you're going to taste God's everlasting destruction. You just won't be destroyed and burned up. You'll be destroyed and destroyed and destroyed and destroyed and destroyed and destroyed and destroyed, and destroyed for all eternity. Go talk to your lost friends, would you? They need your help. 2 Peter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there were false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. They send folks to hell. Even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. I like that. Pernicious way. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. The trouble with these false prophets is people lump us all together with Christians and things. And it's not true. It's not true. A real born again Bible reading Christian is different from everybody else. And you know what God will do? See, them ditches were for a purpose. They were, it was like the cheese in the trap. And if you go against God, he'll make sure you fall into the devil's mouth trap. First Timothy 6, 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Uh, Proverbs 10, 29, the way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. John 14, 6, says, what's the way out, Brother Jeff? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. There's a way out, lost person. There's a way out, religious man. There's a way out, sinner. But you have to come to God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There is a place along the Hudson River up in the northern country of the United States where as you sail a boat down, down the river, it will seem to you like you're entirely hemmed in and can't get out of the river. The current seems to be going the wrong way and dashing you toward the cliffs or the shore. And, and it seems like you either have to stop the boat and go to the shore and get off the boat or you're going to be dashed to pieces. And just as you come into the shadow of the mountain that you're worried about, all of a sudden you'll see an opening that you couldn't see before. And there it is. You can take that boat and you can steer to that opening. And guess what? You're in open water again. I imagine in the days when the river was being explored or, or navigated for the first times, back in the old days, People would bring their boat to shore and get off the boat. Or people would uh, somehow turn around and go the other way. But when they discovered that little passage, the fear went away. And people began to navigate the Hudson. Well, that's the way it is with our lives. The, devil, the devil's got us in his boat. And we're traveling down the current of life. And you know what? It seems for sure we're going to be dashed to pieces against the rocks. 
And then we turn the corner and there Jesus is standing saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I am the, way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, what happened in that battle? They went and they dug the ditches. Well, what in the world happened? Well, let's look at verse 21. Chapter, 1 Kings chapter 3. And when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. And they arose up early in the morning and the sun shone upon the water. Remember the water had come down and filled the ditches. And the sun shone upon the water and the Moabites saw the water on the other side red as blood. You know how the sun comes up red sometimes. So God made sure the sun came up red that morning. And they looked down in that valley and they saw all these pools of blood. I said, that's what they thought they saw. And they said, this is blood. The kings are, are surely slain. And they have smitten one another. Now therefore Moab to the spoil. So they run down to the valley full of ditches. Well, I, uh, I guess that didn't work out so well. And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites. Uh, they left their lessons, uh, their weapons and their helmets and their armor and stuff behind. They were, they were after the goodies. So they come into the camp. Israel rose up and they cleaned their clock. So that they fled before them and they went forward smiting the Moabites even in their country and they beat down the cities and on every good place of the land cast every man his stone and filled it and they stopped all the wells of water and fell all the good trees only in uh, Kirhasheth Kirhasheth left they the stones thereof howbeit the slingers went, went about and smote it. And when the kings of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men and drew, that drew swords and break through even to the king of Edom, and, but they could not. Then they took his eldest son that should reign in his stead, and they offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was a great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned unto their own land. God delivered the children of Israel. Brought the enemy to them without any armor and stuff and they whooped them. Whooped them so bad that not even their religion could satisfy them and they just finally gave up and went home. In this life we must learn to wait for God's work in our life and our deliverance. Genesis 49, there's a prophecy about Dan, one of Jacob's sons. It's the first mention in the Bible of the word salvation. Genesis 49:18 says, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. There's a song that we don't sing much. In the hour of trial, Jesus plead for me, lest by base denial I depart from thee. When thou seest me waver with a look recall, I'm, not, I'm butchering this. Nor in fear or favor suffer me to fall. With forbidden pleasure would this vain world charm. Nor its sordid treasures spread to work me harm. Bring to my remembrance sad Gethsemane. Nor in darker semblance cross crown Calvary. Should thy mercy send me sorrow, toil, and woe, or should pain attend me on my path below, grant that I may never fail thy hand to see. Grant that I may ever cast my care on thee. 
When in dust and ashes to the grave I sink, while heaven's glory flashes o'er the shelved brink, on thy truth relying, through that mortal strife, Lord, receive me dying to eternal life. God is always there, folks. Sometimes he'll let stuff happen that's weird and kind of strange. But what we need to do is we need to trust in him. Let's every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we go our way, God, help us now. God, I pray you just uh, protect us as we go out into this world. And God, if the enemy surrounds us and God cuts us off or we seem like we can't get out, God, I pray you show us your power and your might. God, help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.